Uh, I'm delighted uh, to see so many uh, uh, people back from uh, back who are here and joined us at our first conference in May. Uh, delighted to see so many new faces as well. Um, I'm um, particularly pleased the timing here, I think, uh, for this conference couldn't be better. Um, both generally, um, the markets have um, become a lot more uh, interesting and um, I wouldn't call it a good environment for short selling, but uh, at least it's not a horrifically bad environment, uh, which, is, which is what it's been for most of the last decade. And uh, given where the market's indicating open today, it's particularly good timing today. There, uh, the market may be offering uh, good entry points for uh, some of the uh, ideas we'll be hearing today. Um, I want to thank, uh, be sure to thank our sponsors, um, Centerpoint um, Securities, uh, Velocity Capital, um, and Activist Insight. You'll be hearing from them later today. And um, uh, I want to um, move quickly and, and get our first speaker up here. Um, he's got 129 slides um, and a great idea. Uh, Gabriel Grego's been a friend of mine for uh, many, many years now. Um, he actually first reached out to me when he was living in Israel, um, and he was short SodaStream, and I was long SodaStream, and he reached out to me and said, did I want to compare notes? And I really respected that, and I wanted to hear the contrary viewpoint. SodaStream is an Israeli-based company. Um, and it turns out we were both right. Um, the stock went down by two-thirds, uh, so he was right on the short side, and then it went up 12x, um, and I was right on the long side. Um, so uh, uh, Gabriel uh, is a long short manager who's been doing this for quite a while, but he's really made a name for himself in identifying uh, fraudulent companies, generally international companies, where uh, he has done, uh, does extraordinary due diligence. You saw that, uh, those of you who were here in May, uh, where um, he exposed uh, total fraud at Foley Foley. Uh, the stock was halted uh, by the Greek regulators uh, less than two weeks later. Uh, and has never traded again. Um, they did an investigation and that, uh, verified and validated everything Gabriel had uh, discovered. Um, he has found another, uh, uh, another uh, similar situation, I think, having uh, reviewed the presentation. Um, so um, I can't wait for him to share it with you. So uh, please welcome uh, Gabriel Grego. You all hear me? Yes. Well, by the way, I covered SodaStream before the 12X. Uh, <laughs> um, OK, great. So um, <clears throat> we have a long presentation, so I'm not going to waste too much time doing um, introductions. We're going to get right to business. The only thing I need to know is how this thing works. Green button on the left. OK. And behind is the red button on the left? Great. OK, uh, just a few things to understand like the general principle. What we do is we only go after catastrophic situations, typically fraud. <clears throat> we only act if we have what I believe is overwhelming evidence uh, to probably take the company down if the thesis is correct. And we only act. In other words, we don't shorten hope. Um, so this is what I'm trying to do here. And I would like to give uh, recognition to my good friend and the person who actually, number one, had this idea, and number two, uh, share with me the burden of this, um, of this work, which is Nate Anderson from Hindenburg Research, which should be somewhere in this room. If you want to stand up. There you go. Thank you, Nate. So <clears throat> as I said, and I also said at the last time we were here, uh, I'm not too courageous when I'm doing this kind of campaigns, so I only act if I'm 100% sure. On average, if we act against a company, and these are the only five times we acted against a company, this is the sixth time today, in, uh, in about three years, the average uh, stock price drop has been around 90%. Um, I hope the same thing is going to happen today. But you all want to get to business, so let's get to business. The company is called Afria. Uh, I suppose many of you may be familiar with it. It's a cannabis company. But this presentation is not about cannabis. Uh, we have our own opinion about cannabis, and they're not relevant. We believe that something very sinister and very particular may be happening at this company. And that's why I gave it the title, A Black Hole for Shareholders' Money, because exactly this is what's happening here. Let's get to business. A darling of the cannabis industry, almost $3 billion Canadian dollar market cap. It used to be five until recently. 
Uh, Stom is held in Canada, but it recently started trading on the New York Stock Exchange. We'll see whether that will prove to be a mistake. Uh, sales, about $30 million. EBITDA, negative, um, half a million. And price to sales ratio until recently was 85 times. It's now definitely a value stock. Uh, again, you can see the market cap versus sales. Fair, sales are almost non-existent. And the interesting thing is lately, since last year, they started on a, a, a very ambitious investment campaign. Have you seen they've been burning cash? They don't generate any cash from operation. And they've been using a lot of cash from investments at, at an accelerating rate. We'll see how this is critical to the thesis. <clears throat> Because of this acquisition, their balance sheet right now is mostly composed by goodwill, intangibles, and a few investments in, in cannabis stocks. So in other words, if the value of this acquisition proves to be nil, we believe the same thing should happen to the value of the company. That is the way that Afria likes to portray itself. They keep touting this sentence. They want to be the low cost pot, uh, pot producers. We will see exactly whether the company is actually low cost. What we believe is the reality here behind the veil that the company tries to portray. The company went on a 700 million Canadian dollars m and spree. Prices paid for these assets are incredibly outrageous for buying what we believe are nearly worthless assets. Acquisition had been executed by, with a bunch of shell companies, apparently unrelated, but we believe are secretly controlled and most likely owned by insiders. In short, we believe that Afria besides being a company, is actually a scheme to funnel money from retail investors into the pockets of shareholders. These are uh, what we define as insiders. On the right, you see Vic Neufeld, which is the CEO of Afria, and the chairman of Scythian. Scythian is the sister company of Afria, which Afria seems to use as its vehicles to perform the first of these double-dipping M&A. And the guy in the middle, that's a real photograph. We, you know, we took it from his Instagram account is uh, Mr. Andy DeFrancesco. He is a, a former broker and investment banker. And he self-defines himself as the architect of both Afria and Scythian, is the person behind the reverse merger of both companies, and is now also the chairman and chief investment officer of Scythian, which is a sister company of Afria. What do we believe is going on? In our opinion, money is funneled from retail shareholders into Afria, which then buys companies from its sister company, Scythian, uh, which in turn takes over all sort of uh, companies in emerging markets mostly, but it doesn't take them over directly, but always going through these uh, shell companies, typically Canadian shell companies, which theoretically are arms length transaction, but in practice, those companies, we believe, we will show you very strong evidence that they're actually related to the companies insiders themselves. So in other words, they open these companies, they make almost worthless acquisition in emerging markets, and then they use their own public vehicle to take themselves over. That is the thesis, that is our opinion. There is a prologue. So earlier this year, Afria closed a deal of almost half a billion Canadian dollars to buy this company called Nuvera. Nuvera was nothing more than a bunch of non-binding letters of intents and was, was bought for half a billion dollars. Nobody almost even ever heard of the company. Hindenburg Research, which sits today right here at the table, uh, wrote a daring report on, uh, on this transaction, flagging some, some red flags. Number one, the fact that the company seemed to be almost worthless, and number two, the fact that it looked like insiders had bought themselves personal stakes in the M&A target before they caused Afria to take, the, to, to take the company over. The Canadian press reported on it, and the thesis was validated. At the end of the day, the insiders admitted having in, shares in the takeover target uh, and didn't disclose it. The stock went down as much as 30%, but then went back up because of the uh, cannabis uh, boom that you saw this summer. Ladies and gentlemen, we're here to tell you that they are at it again. They're doing it again in an even more blatant way with their Latin American acquisition. Only this time, I believe we caught them. They bought three companies, one in Jamaica called Marigold, one in Colombia called Colcana, and one in Argentina called ABPSA. The company defines this company as leading assets in Latin America and the Caribbean. This is how the acquisition were performed. We saw before, Afria bought them from Scythian, who bought them from these three shell companies um, in Canada. And these shell companies bought the assets themselves in these emerging countries um, just a few months before. The first acquisition we're going to review is a company called Marigold. Uh, they bought this company for 145 million Canadian dollars, about 120 million US. This is the press release when they bought the company. 
Uh, they're proud to have received all these licenses from the Jamaican Cannabis Licensing Authority. They believe they have a team with cutting edge science and a prestigious management team uh, led by this guy, Lloyd Tomlinson, who will continue as managing director of the company. Great, that's what they say. What's the reality? We've been on the field. We look for this company inside and out. Uh, we saw the infrastructure. We dig very deeply into the official filings. We sought out the directors. We checked out the residential address and so on and so forth. Um, and we will show how the reality is quite different. First of all, when the company was acquired, <clears throat> very little was disclosed about it. There was not even an address. Uh, there was not even a website. We found the registered address of the company by looking at the official filings. You can see right there, the company is located on 28 Lancaster Road in Kingston, Jamaica. And of course, we visited. That's myself. That's right in front uh, 28 Lancaster Road. And that is uh, what is supposed to be the registered address of a $150 million company. <clears throat> From outside, it looks OK. A bit residential, but maybe passable. And I'd like to stress that this was taken uh, at 10 AM in the morning in the middle of a working day. I think the pictures speak for themselves. From the outside, it doesn't look too promising. It looks like a little, maybe R&D facility right there. <laughs> That's the inside, ladies and gentlemen, inside the building of our $150 million company. So what's going on here? We went to check out the property records, and we saw that that property actually used to belong uh, up to one year ago to this guy, Lloyd Tomlinson, who presents himself as the managing director of the company. But the property was foreclosed by CIBC Bank and would then for sale to the Jamaica Music Society, which has nothing to do whatsoever with Marigold. Those are the official findings. We uh, copy-pasted for you. After that, on September 2018, so after our first visit to Jamaica, <clears throat> the company released this document whereby they claim that uh, Afria has all sort of leases. So uh, an agricultural plot that we looked for for about two months, we never could find it. Doesn't mean it doesn't exist, but we couldn't find it. Uh, an office space on 22 Trafalgar Road in Kingston, and what they call the Herb House at 38 Trafalgar Road in Kingston. So of course we went to check them out. That's the office space. And that's what it looks like. We went to visit it, again, during office hours. And the, the door is locked. The lights are on, but the door is locked. It's a one and a half room office. We spoke to the neighbors who say that the people that work there barely ever show up. So it's virtually inactive. You can see there there is a paper sign for a $150 million company more than six months after the acquisition. And a little plant right there that probably needs a little watering. More shockingly, we found out that the, late, the date for closing of this lease was the 23rd of April, 2018, which is way after the acquisition was even announced. In other words, when the company got acquired, its only office was the dilapidated building you saw before. Moving right on, <clears throat> that's a, what they call the Herb House, that they say it is at 38 Trafalgar, Unit 51. We went to check it out, and guess what? Uh, the landlord told us, hey, there is no Unit 51. You don't have to take it from me, talk, take it from our men in, in Kingston that uh, checked it out. Oh, there's no audio here? No? All right, sorry. Well, something's wrong with the presentation, but let's keep going. <clears throat> that is the list of Marigold directors. You see Lloyd Tomlinson, Delroy Barrett, and a bunch of others. We studied some of them as much as we could. Um, and here what came out. The first director, we actually met with her. Uh, we didn't discuss, of course, Marigold Affairs, but we just wanted to understand what kind of a person she was. She was a very nice lady in Kingston, Jamaica. That's myself right outside of her office. I sat a couple of times with her for a couple of hours. Uh, and uh, guess what? She said that she never uh, ever even served on any corporate board, let alone Marigold. And she even signed the document, you see right there, that's her passport, where she denies in writing ever serving on a corporate board and not being affiliated with any company except for the Jamaican Stock Exchange uh, Best Practices Committee. There is no mention on Marigold whatsoever, even though you can see that on the top right, uh, that uh, document was taken from uh, Marigold official filings. That's her signature as a director of Marigold. Take your own conclusions.
just the stock exchange. I didn't hear any Marigold or anything else over there. Moving on, the managing director, Mr. Lloyd Tomlinson of Marigold, which is also a director, <clears throat> you can see that on the official filings, he write down that his residential address after the property was repossessed, and according to the information we saw, was actually the dilapidated building that we saw before. So both Marigold and his CEO are supposed to, to live in that place. Moving on, we have this other director called Mr. Ray Anthony Chin, who calls himself a genetic engineer living on number seven Norbrook Crescent in Kingston, Jamaica. Of course, we visited a place. That's myself in front of number seven Norbrook Crescent in Jamaica. <clears throat> I spoke with the tenant. There is no mention of any Ray Anthony Chin. Nobody ever heard about him. Maybe he was living there before, maybe not. Moving right on. He's a really a genetic engineer. There is no LinkedIn page, no trace of him in any university, no social media present, no Richard Gate, nothing whatsoever. A mystery cutting edge scientist, apparently. Let's keep going. Next director, Mr. Bill Dina, who calls himself on the documents an engineer. We couldn't find him anywhere. The only trace of him we found is on this web uh, LinkedIn page that lists a person with the same name as a student. No engineer here. So directors that uh, douse on their residential addresses, on their profession, and they deny their involvement with this company. This is a free press release where they're boasting about receiving this prestigious and hard to get probably licenses from the Jamaican authority. Uh, which, you know, since the company doesn't have an office operation or prestigious directors, maybe it's, the, it's what is justifying a $150 million valuation. So what did we do? We went to check out and spoke with the people at the, at the Jamaica Cannabis Authority. I spent with them a couple of hours and asked them, you know, what's so special about these licenses? The answer, nothing. They already gave out, by the time of this acquisition, already 80 of them, 22 final ones. How much does it cost? $500. How long does it take? Less than six months. Is it given only to exceptional people you know, with incredible scientific achievements? No, they get given to everybody automatically as long as you don't have a criminal record and you're in good standing. More worryingly, Mr. Tomlinson foolishly gave an interview to the Gleaner, which is the major Jamaican newspaper, where in this interview he seems to say that they're still waiting for final licenses. In other words, they only have conditional licenses with which presumably they cannot produce because they're not producing anything. They don't have any open herb houses yet and no production. Finally, we can see the uh, comparable transaction of this company. So a lot of Canadian companies, some Canadian companies went to Jamaica and bought themselves a local producer. We only found overall four transactions, including, including Marigold. Two of them went out for 10 million uh, US dollars, and, uh, sorry, Canadian dollars, one for two and a half million. The R&D Pharma transaction is very similar to, uh, to the one we just saw, to Marigold. In other words, they're buying uh, licenses and, and a little plot, plot of land, apparently. So, when the other Canadian companies buy a company in Jamaica, even by the crazy cannabis standards of today, they pay from 10 to 2 $2.5 million. But if Afria buys a company, they pay $150 million almost. What's going on? Is it just a case of really bad management, or there is something more going on? Because they're spending $145 million for no sales, no assets, no operations, and only conditional licenses. Where did the money go? Well, you need to follow the money to understand. <clears throat> You can see over there the flow of money, uh, but in chronological order, we believe that insiders, they basically shop around uh, emerging countries. But they buy themselves uh, what is a nearly worthless asset or a very small company for themselves, for companies they themselves control. And then they cause first Scythian, a public company we believe they control, and then Afria to take them over at increasing prices. For example, in this case, the shell company that seemed to have been used is called Marigold Acquisition. You can see it there in yellow. Here you see the, uh, the timing of all the transactions. You see Marigold Acquisition turns up in the official press release by Scythian when they originally, when they originally announced the M&A. The name of the company, again, is Marigold Acquisition. And here we're going to show you the first of many smoking guns of this presentation. Who is behind this Marigold Acquisition? Is this uh, transaction arm's length? because no insiders ever disclosed their involvement with this company. Marigold Acquisition, ladies and gentlemen, was actually called De Lavaco Ventures. What is De Lavaco? De Lavaco is the personal investment bank of the guy you see on the right that we saw earlier, Mr. Andy De Francesco, um, who is behind both the three uh, and Scythian. He's currently the CIO of Scythian. He's the person who engineered all the financial deals. And you see that they actually changed the name of the company 
from De Lavaco Ventures, De Lavaco is the name of his personal company, into something neutral like Marigold Acquisitions, in our opinion, to hide the fact that they're involved, that their insider is actually involved in the company that they're just selling to their public parent. We saw also some other worrying traces. This Marvin Eigelman and Clifford Stark were given, almost given, the same stake that was later purchased by a free for $150 million about a year later um, at the price of one Jamaican dollar per share, a total of 100 US dollar for half that company. This is the official findings that seem to suggest this. Who are these people? Well, these people look very suspiciously close to De Lavaco and De Francesco, uh, resident in Canada. This guy, Marvin Eigelman, worked for many years under De Francesco at Standard Securities, and he had an active role in many deals that were backed by this De Lavaco. Similar story for this Clifford Stark. Moving on, the next acquisition, $84 million acquisition of Colcana, a similar company, this time in Colombia. This is the press release where they say that, again, they bought this, this company, not directly, but through a Canadian shell company, this time called MMJ Colombia. We'll get to this later. This company at least has an office, has a presence. Of course, we visited the office and took photographs from the inside. It's not exactly what you would expect for a hundred almost million dollar company, but you know, there are people working there. We cannot say the same about the infrastructure and the plot of land that don't seem exactly state of the art. <clears throat> More worryingly, at the time of acquisition, the company didn't have licenses yet, and they even wrote it on their website. They said they were still waiting for the licenses. This is the official filings which show that number one, the company was established only three months before the announced M&A deal, and it had zero sales and pretty much zero assets right there in the official filings. So we asked around some people which are familiar with the Canadian cannabis industry and with Latin American reality. What did they say? Quote, at the time of purchase, Colcana didn't even have a license. You shouldn't view the Colcana deal as representative of values because it's a very stinky deal. What does it mean by that? Source number two, quote, I don't think Colcana is the one of the four companies approved to do characterization, which is a necessary requirement for cultivation. If the company doesn't have it, then it's a huge red flag. Moving on. This time we found plenty of comparable transactions. Pretty much every large Canadian player bought themselves their little corner in Colombia to produce local cannabis. On average, the price paid per hectare of land uh, was about 900,000 uh, Canadian dollars. Guess what is the price paid by Afria? Five times as much, almost four and a half million Canadian dollars for that transaction. It's a total outlier. Again, where did the money go? It's the same story. Flows from shareholders through copious and diluting share issues into Afria which then bought the company, Colcana, we just saw for 84 million, who shortly before that bought it from Scythian for 39 million, which bought it itself from this shell company called MMJ Colombia, which we believe is related to the insiders for reasons we believe. The assets bought themselves are probably much cheaper than that, and in our opinion, nearly worthless. Second smoking gun that we're going to show you. Guess who is behind MMJ Colombia? In what starts to look like a familiar pattern now, the former name of MMJ Colombia was changed two, two months before the acquisition. The former name was De Lavaco Colombia Partners, Inc. And De Lavaco is the company that belongs to one of the insiders, Mr. De Francesco. They changed the name right before. Guess who is the administrator of the shell company? Mrs. Catherine De Francesco. Who is she? She's the wife of Mr. De Francesco. Moving on, third company, ABP. This company was bought for 50 million Canadian dollars. This is the press release, quote, ABPSA is an established and successful pharmaceutical import and distribution company with a, lot of bunch, with a bunch of prestigious research agreement and, uh, and um, with the prestigious Argentine hospitals. Okay, so from reading this press release in full, you would guess that they just bought themselves Express Script or McKesson or some, or some CVS, like a large distribution chain in all of South America. When they made the acquisition, they said that the company sold around 11 million US dollars and was profitable. The reality, according to us, ABP is not a large distribution company. It's actually a single retail pharmacy of one shop in a bad neighborhood of Buenos Aires. Um, the office is in a usual dilapidated building. Seemingly lucrative contracts, incredibly, are just donations. So they're essentially the, the free is giving com uh, ABP and the free are giving our product for free. And finally, really interestingly, we found out that ABP sales, according to uh, the evidence that we will show you, are not $11 million, but $430,000. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to ABPSA. 
that's what the company is, is one retail pharmacy in this neighborhood in Buenos Aires. That's the address taken from Google. And of course, we went inside so you can take a pic. One pharmacy, much smaller than your local CVS, for $50 million. That's a receipt as a proof that we visited the place with the name of the company right there. This is the office on Juan Carlos Gomez 68. It's in another area in Buenos Aires you probably don't want to go at night. Um, it took us two visits just to figure out how to get in. You will see that there is a door right next to the tree. That's, that's actually the entrance. There is no sign whatsoever, no intercom, nothing. Of course, it would have been nice to visit the facilities and to visit what's actually inside the company, the office itself. And so that's exactly what we're going to do now. In our understanding, the company is, is on the third floor of this building. That's it. This room, to our understanding, is the offices of ABP. A bunch of janitors, one chair, one PC, and a few cardboard boxes for a $50 million company. That's what it looks like. Moving right on. These are the people that work for the company. Uh, this is the CEO. His, uh, his resume seems compatible with the person that runs a single pharmacy. Gustavo, who on LinkedIn he writes he's a student. Mr. Martin Irala, who is a, a worker of ABP on LinkedIn, but a soccer player and coach on Facebook, and he's 20 years old. We checked the web prominence of this company, and it was completely undetectable, both on Alexa and on similar web, so there is no website traffic whatsoever. They opened a Facebook page way after the acquisition with only seven followers who we presume are either a free or ABP employees. There is nothing new posted since August. Remember when we say that the company declared that the turnover of ABP is $11 million, right? Yes. First of all, you see on Dan and Bradstreet, the actual amount is more like $200,000, which is what you would expect from a single pharmacy. And then we went to ask uh, uh, Mr. Gustavo, that works over there, what is the uh, turnover of the company works for? The answer was 15 million Argentine pesos, $400,000, US dollars. Um, let's see if the other works. I expect it will not. Okay. Actually, it does. E, quant okay. In, in, in le, quanto è la más o menos para para comprender eh, la dimensión del, del negocio en Argentina. Sí, la, la ventas, tú, la ventas para un orden de grandeza, por, por comprender, so, eh, 100 mil dólares o 5 millones, no sé, más o menos. $15 million de pesos argentinos. Sí. Okay. For those of you who don't understand Spanish, $15 million Argentine pesos is $400,000 at today's exchange rate. Next, they touted a lot, as much as they could, this uh, deal with the Garahan Hospital, a prestigious pediatric hospital in Buenos Aires. You can see it in the photograph. This is the press release where Scythian, again, the sister company of Afria, which first took over that shell, is boasting about having closed its first purchase order with this, with this prestigious hospital. You see there, this, the, the word purchase order that appears twice. 
Guess what, though? A press release, this time in Spanish, from the Garrigan Hospital says that it's not a purchase, but actually that Afria will donate, Afria from Canada will donate the drug to the hospital. So which is which? Are, are, are they buying or, or is this a donation? So we went to ask to the Garrigan Hospital. You can see there myself speaking with Mr. Schiaffini, who is the Department Chief of Communication for the Garrigan Hospital, who says, yeah, it's a donation. You don't have to take my word for him. Let's hear from him. Oh, actually, it looks like the audio is not there. It is. In other words, Afria is donating them the money for free for a lifelong longitudinal study of 100 kids which suffer from epilepsy. They're going to have to give them all for free, uh, pretty much for all of their life. Um, the hospital is very grateful for the generous donation, courtesy of Afria's shareholders, but they say that they are being bugged all the time by Afria that keeps calling them to issue press releases about this transaction. Moving on. So Tilray, which is not exactly a value of stock, just bought themselves a very similar company uh, with a similar rationale, uh, a pharmaceutical, a bunch of pharmacies in, in Chile, which with President South America, for five million Canadian dollars. This company, we checked it out, is called Aleph Biotechnology. It has sales of 1.3 million dollars. So how does it work? Tilray, uh, not exactly a cheap stock or one known for its uh, frugality, buys himself a 1.3 million turnover pharmacy and they pay five million dollars. Uh, Afria buys itself a $400,000 pharmacy and they pay uh, $50 million. So one pays four times sales and Afria pays 113 times sales. By now you probably understand what's going on here. Uh, guess which shell company was, was bought. Uh, MMJ International is the shell company that was used to make this acquisition. The same day Andy De Francesco, the guy in the photograph, was made chairman of Scythian. And again, follow the money. Company bought for 50 million from, to a, from Afria to Scythian, which bought it from this MMJ International, which, which bought this worthless pharmacy down there. Again, we believe that behind MMJ International is Mr. De Francesco and its Delavaco private investment group. Another smoking gun. MMJ International was formerly called Delavaco MMJ International. The company changed name exactly two months before the acquisition. Another Canadian shell. Uh, obviously, I mean, it seems to us as though these are attempts to hide the, you know, the involvement of companies insiders into this deal. In case you're not 100% convinced, we'll show you another uh, private Instagram photograph of uh, Mr. De Francesco, who is boasting two days before the acquisition was announced from Scythian of having just bought for himself and his Delavaco group a pharmacy in Argentina while holding a pack of condoms and what we believe is a box of uh, generic Viagra in the other hand. <clears throat> you can see there Andy Francesco and the Lavaco group. He says, I just bought my first pharmacy in Argentina. He even hashtags greed is good. Again, this was two days before the acquisition was announced. Of course, it doesn't say that this pharmacy is ABP. It says a pharmacy in Argentina. Maybe it's something else. Wrong. That's the photograph taken by myself from a different angle. You can see very well the black chair on the white panel under the window. On the right, you can see the black chair on the white panel under the window. Ladies and gentlemen, that is ABP. He just buys a pharmacy for himself, then sells it to Scythian for $50 million, to, uh, to a free for $50 million. So what did they buy for $736 million Canadian dollars? Well, a bunch of assets, as you saw before. Uh, mostly dilapidated building, health licenses, and so on, and, and single pharmacies. Who is this De Francesco guy which seems to be behind this whole game? Well, he was integral to the formation of Scythian and Afria. He's been orchestrating the reverse mergers that took them public. 
He's the founding investor, Serpil Crane, founding investor, and special advisor to both companies, leading all the financing rounds, currently serving as the chairman and CEO of Scythian, <clears throat> and the CIO of Delavaco Group. Interestingly, if it's not enough evidence to see that this guy is an insider, Scythian address, corporate address, is the same place as his personal company address, Delavaco. And this is a screenshot we took from his website. He removed this part, obviously, later on, but we, we got it on the time back, well, way back machine, where he calls himself the finding investor to Afria. Therefore, for all practical purposes, one of Afria's insiders. What do the Canadian regulators think about this character? <clears throat> Quote, he was deceptive and had little regard for truth. This is a complaint about Andrea Francesco, about actually a guy called um, Bobby Genovese, which we will see shortly, and also his relationship with, relationship with Mr. De Francesco by the, what we understand is Canadian equivalent of the SEC, was deceitful, was deceptive, little regard for truth. Who is Bobby Genovese that shares with him this complaint, apparently? Well, a person charged with fraud. Another interesting association is with the guy called Barry Honig, which I'm sure at least half of the people in this room know very well who he is. You can see him stepping off his private jet. Um, the SEC charged him for uh, manipulation and pump and dump schemes. You can see here too, microcap fraud schemes. Why do we believe they're associated? Well, they show up as shareholders in similar companies, for example, Riot Blockchain that collapsed 95%. Um, my friend Hindenburg wrote a very nice report on it. <clears throat> and uh, he was also, through apparently uh, his company, a, an active investor to this riot, ousting the previous board of directors and replacing it with people with, which shortly after was where all uh, alleged by the SEC to have committed market manipulation. But we will show you another smoking gun if somebody has doubts whether Mr. De Francesco and Barry Honing are deeply associated. De Lavaco's address is right here on 2300 Las Olas Boulevard in Fort Lauderdale. That property is owned by a company called La Sola Sunset Bay. Guess what? Guess who manages this La Sola Sunset Bay? And this is another smoking gun we're going to show you. The sole managers of La Sola Sunset Bay are Mr. Barry Honig and Andy DeFrancesco. Moving right on. Evidence from field sources. Well, we spoke to a lot of people in the industry and we asked them, hey, hey I mean, th this is really strong evidence. Are we dreaming of there is something here? This is what they say. And I quote, from a private equity investor with experience in Canada and Latin America. There is no way that ABP and Colcan are worth $90 million each. There is something fishy going on. And another one. They have historically had their hands on a lot of companies that get vended into Afria, and rumors are that this is what happened here. And again, there is some double dipping going on. The Afria guys were also on the inside of Scythian. The Latin companies get vended to Scythian and then onto Afria. And again, get this. When Marigold was sold to Scythian, it was the Afria guys who turned up for the due diligence visit. This was well before the Afria deal was even announced. It's pretty sketchy. Take a look at Andy De Francesco, I'll say no more. And more. Nuvera was a shady company. They went around Europe acquiring licenses and letter of intents with governments. These were of questionable value, but the company paid them also almost 800 million. Eventually the offer was toned down to 400, by the way. Afria insiders had shares in Nuvera. It was a pump and dump. It's assumed by everyone in the industry that Scythian is the Latin American version of Nuvera. And more, Afria is the one that did the due diligence on the Jamaica project, like the other guy was saying before. Even before it was announced that they were taking over Scythian, there were Afria guys with investments in those companies and they benefited from the pump. And damningly, quote, insiders had positions in Scythian and they dumped it onto Afria shareholders. Another name you should look into is Andy De Francesco. He's the guy rumored to have put the whole thing together. Finally, we heard a lot of rumors that the, the quality of the, uh, of the merchandise is of questionable quality. So we spoke to a former worker, a factory floor worker, who basically told us what is the condition of the factory floor. And I quote, a lot of people who are running the shows are young, they don't know what they're doing. We're constantly running into errors and not passing audits with Health Canada and having issues with bugs. It kind of became like a circus. There is a huge lack of communication. It's getting worse and worse. We had a lot of issues with mold, and right now the facility is infested with bugs. Every single room that has product in that Lemington facility right now has bug problems. To sum up Afria, you're talking about a almost $3 billion company with virtually no sales, assets acquired at absurd valuations, extensive evidence of insider transactions, likely to have to take a giant write-off because that, uh, that balance sheet, that goodwill, and the intangible that they bought are, are the companies, are the dilapidated buildings that you saw before, which don't even belong to the company, by the way. So we're pretty confident in saying that the target price for this Afria 
is zero. Thank you very much. Happy to take questions if we're not too late. Uh, we have time for a few questions. If um, um, yes, uh, let's see. Uh, Glenn, go ahead. Um, uh, wait for the microphone, Glenn. Someone's come. Well, they, they have uh, some production facilities, which for this industry mostly means uh, greenhouses in Canada. Uh, they have cash because they keep re uh, issuing shares all the time. So they have some cash which is raised by some shares. I'm sure they spent a lot of it in, in these latest transactions. We'll, we'll see it in the next earnings report. Uh, so the company is not leveraged. In other words, I don't think we'll have cash issues immediately. Uh, but I, don't, I wouldn't see anything else that would justify not even anything close to this value. Again, sales are uh, about 30 million Canadian dollars uh, for a market cap of 3 billion. Yeah. Uh, right up front here. Oh, someone back there, and then we'll go up front. Go ahead. Terrific uh, presentation. Uh, I think the stock's down 30% in the pre-market, uh, just as an indication. So when you were in Jamaica, did you try to get a license yourself? Was it that easy to get a <laughs> cannabis license? Uh, well, I probably could not have taken a license, uh, even though I went over there to inquire how does it work. The reason is those licenses are given only to Jamaican uh, people, uh, citizens, or even Jamaicans living abroad. So no, the, the answer is I went there just asking some question and, and told them that I wanted to learn how it worked. Hey, uh, question. So about a month ago, maybe two months ago, there was a story in the Canadian press that said that Altria was actually looking uh, to invest in this company. Yes. And I was wondering, during the course of your due diligence, did you actually speak to Altria? Uh, was there any truth to this? Did they do due diligence? Did they see the same things that you had seen? Uh, were they some of the sources that were up there mentioned? No. Uh, well, first of all, <clears throat> we did not seek out, of course, Altria because it probably would not have been legal. Um, we didn't see in the course of our due diligence anything that even remotely makes us think that there is an imminent deal. And we assume that uh, before they, uh, even assuming that they're about to make a deal, which I really don't think so, um, the deal would be immediately torpedoed if they just take a peek at whatever they're trying to buy. Uh, back here, all the way in the back. Thanks, great work. Um, do you, the stock's down pre market. do you think that's people selling or shorting? Do people that own the stock know what they own? Well, it's very interesting because theoretically nobody outside this room should know about it. Um, so I don't know. So I would guess that maybe some of you guys are trading online um, when I'm speaking. I actually, <laughs> Gabriel, your um, office, um, as you were speaking, sent around saying, you know, dear friends of Quintessential and sent out a copy of the slides. And um, Hindenburg Research just published on Seeking Alpha. Got it. Um, uh, so well, then I guess it's panic selling by so, retail shareholders. So, so uh, your work is, uh, both your work and the Hindenburg article are now both out there publicly. Um, so yeah, right here. So two questions. Uh, so I noticed that Andy DuFrancesco spent a lot of time on Twitter and Reddit defending himself, and uh, especially the new Vera transaction. Mm -hmm. And it almost seemed, I don't know if maybe it was just the greater cannabis market that lifted the stock back up previously. Do you think there's any way that he can talk his way out of this? That's very interesting. Like, I'm not a lawyer, so uh, my opinion probably doesn't count very much as to understand what are the legal implications of this. As a person that doesn't understand much about law, it seems to be extremely serious. So, okay, there is always a way out, but when I show this to the legals that uh, follow our firm, they said that this is pretty damning. And did you have an idea, um, as far as your cash, when, when do you see that running out? It's very hard to say. Usually what happens in, in these things, if people uh, believe what we're saying and understand the thesis, they will find it impossible to raise any further cash in the future through share issues. So it's just a matter of time. Uh, the cash burn rate is not enormous yet, so I'm, I'm sure they have gas at least for another year. Okay, so okay. one year. Yeah, just a commentary on that. What I did notice was that it seems the cannabis space has 
Uh, recently, MedMen had done a bot deal that they had the downside. So it seems to me that maybe we've peaked and it is trending a little bit down where investment banks are less likely to fund this. So I think that could be, obviously, down the line, you know, a lack of, uh, you know, ability for them to tap the capital markets for sure just with all this overhang. Yeah, I mean, look, we, again, we didn't do this to, to damage the cannabis industry. I think it's a legitimate industry. I think investors should be careful in, every time they're buying something at, at those extremely high valuations. So I wish the other cannabis companies all the best. I just hope that the retail investors of, of Afria, or more importantly, those that could have become retail investors of Afria, to know exactly what they're buying into. So that's why we're doing this. I will share with you one comment from... Uh very experienced um, hedge fund managers who's done a lot of investing in the cannabis space and has hired, um, as is typical whenever he invests anywhere, um, uh, hires a, a company that does background checks for him. And so the woman at the company uh, told him, I didn't even have a chance to share this with you, Gabriel, but said, you know, typically over the many hundreds of background checks that this woman has done for my friend, um, you know, maybe 10% of the background checks reveal significant red flags over the course of you know, hundreds of background checks they've done across many industries. And the woman came back to my friend and just chuckled and said, it's the opposite here. Like basically 90% of the people we do background checks on come up with significant red flags. It's, this industry is the wild west. Um, uh, this is probably just the most extreme example. Um, let me throw a, a question in uh, to you, Gabriel. Do you have any reason, your question, uh, sir, um, you know, sort of assumed that this is a normal company and that, you know, when will they run out of cash, et cetera. But that isn't what happened with Foley Foley. Regulators in Greece halted the stock less than two weeks later, pending an investigation and uh, that revealed that the company was fraudulent and the stock never traded again. It just ceased trading within two weeks. Um, do you have any reason to believe, Gabriel? Uh, can you share anything about uh, whether you uh, have any reason to believe regulators might act in this case? Well, um, I think, and I said at the beginning, that uh, in my opinion, a big mistake was listing themselves on the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, we're not too familiar with uh, how, how many teeth uh, Canadian regulators have, but we are all familiar with the SEC, and I'm sure that uh, they'll be extremely interested in understanding whether our thesis is correct. Okay. Um, why don't we, uh, we've gone a little bit over, but fortunately we built in some extra time at the break. So um, uh, Gabriel, will you be around today, if uh, just around uh, staying at the conference today? Yeah, absolutely. Um, for people who want to follow up at any of the breaks uh, uh, with Gabriel. So uh, thank you, tremendous work, Gabriel. Thank you very much.